beyond all you think you know lies an undiscovered Egypt. I kept saying to myself, my God, I can't believe it. And what happened next is one of the great moments of modern archaeology. A great pharaoh welcomes his children to the underworld. It turned into the most incredible sight I'd ever seen in my life. Hidden tombs unearthed after thousands of years. Nothing like this has ever been found before. Now, Peter Woodward guides you through an Egypt few are privileged to see. Egypt beyond the pyramids. 500 miles south of Cairo, a stunningly beautiful temple perches on the edge of the vast desert. Within its walls lies a toppled thousand-ton image of one of Egypt's greatest kings, who left behind one of Egypt's greatest mysteries, the fate of his many children. It is a saga that some believe will end in a remote tomb in the legendary Valley of the Kings. This jumbled pile of huge stones was once a statue of Ramesses II, ruler of Egypt over 1,200 years before the Christian era. His face gazes towards the sky, and here is a shoulder. This was one of the greatest statues ever carved, and it was erected here at the Ramesseum, Ramses' mortuary temple close to present-day Luxor. In the fifth century AD, the Coptic Christians are believed to have pulled down the statue, and over the centuries, earthquakes further destroyed the fallen pharaoh's likeness. Of course, Ramses had the last word. His image today is anything but a colossal wreck. This statue better symbolizes the role of Ramses II in Egypt's history. He was a king who led his armies to victory, who built the most astonishing structures all over Egypt, he ruled for 67 years. His was a reign longer than all but one pharaoh, and when he died, history would remember him as Ramesses the Great. Ramesses was in his early 20s when he succeeded his father, Seti I, in 1280 BC. Seti had been a dynamic and successful pharaoh, and saw to it that his son was well prepared to follow him. As a child, young Ramesses accompanied his father to war. He learned firsthand the lessons of leading an army. While still a young man, he studied engineering techniques. He oversaw the stone quarries where the huge obelisks were cut to decorate Egypt's temples. The training paid off. Ramesses II's reign as pharaoh was unsurpassed in its stability and achievement. The teenager who had followed his father into battle became a determined warrior who defended Egypt from outside threats. Ramesses also learned his lessons as an engineer. He left to history some of Egypt's most monumental and beautiful structures. In a civilization of great builders, this pharaoh was certainly one of the greatest. Over 3,000 Egyptian citizens were put to work just to cut the stone for the beautiful temple he dedicated to himself, the Ramesseum. And on towering cliffs overlooking the Nubian Nile, Ramesses had carved one of history's greatest monuments to ego, the breathtaking temple of Abu Simbel. Four colossal statues of the pharaoh himself soar 60 feet high. Eh bien, je pense que, en fait, euh, Ramsès s'inscrit parmi les grandes figures. I think Ramses can be included amongst the greatest historical figures of ancient Egypt. He was a talented military man who saw battle, who, in fact, ensured a certain stability to the kingdom of Egypt. Starting at the Delta and all the way to Nubia, Egypt was covered with monuments which tell the story of his reign. Ramses was indeed a great warrior, and his enormous building projects have awed people since the earliest tourists sailed the Nile in Greek and Roman times. 
During his reign, Egypt's fame and wealth grew, and his subjects experienced a bountiful and secure era. So great was Ramses' opinion of his own accomplishments that he would take the immodest step of declaring himself divine, a god living among mortals. However, his divine status would not have impressed one notable group of visitors to his country. Judeo-Christian tradition names Ramesses II as Pharaoh at the time Moses led the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Of Ramesses' many impressive accomplishments, his greatest may have been his prodigious feats of fatherhood. The beautiful Nefertari was his most famous wife, but he had many other official queens, lesser wives, and concubines. With all of these women, Ramesses fathered over 100 children that we know of, including at least 50 sons. Having many wives and children was probably not unusual for a pharaoh, but what was unusual was that Ramesses proudly listed and portrayed his children on the walls of many of the buildings he constructed. Les enfants de Ramsès, la représentation des enfants de Ramsès dans la plupart de ces temples. He reproduced his children on the walls of the temples in long princely processions where we find both the king's sons and daughters. It's thanks to these lists that we are able to somewhat establish Ramsay's descendants. For most pharaohs of ancient Egypt, we know nothing about the members of the royal family. For Ramses II, we know the names of many of his wives, we know the names of many of his sons and many of his daughters, more than two dozen of each. Ramses II was indeed a, a singular fellow in that um, no other pharaoh before or after him had ever given so much attention to his children. Despite such unusual public acknowledgement by their father, we know very little about the lives of all those children. Being an heir to Ramesses' throne was a frustrating process. He would rule for 67 years and outlive five of his successors. The first of these was Amun Hehepesheth, who died in the 40th year of Ramesses' rule. If indeed Ramesses was the pharaoh of the Exodus, Amun Hehepesheth would have been the firstborn son slain when God sent the seven plagues against Egypt, though it is doubtful history will ever be able to confirm this. Of the other princes of Ramesses, we know few details. Son number four, Khemwezi, was highly regarded and may have been his father's favorite. He was an important priest and oversaw the construction of many of Ramesses' most dramatic building projects. He died in the 55th year of Ramesses' reign. Merneptah was Ramesses' 13th son, and we know little about him until he was appointed general of the army in the 40th year of Ramesses' reign. He was probably the real power behind the throne for the last decade of his father's life. Even as an old king, Ramesses was tall for an Egyptian, five feet eight. In his final years, he was troubled with arthritis and curvature of the spine. And like most of his countrymen, his teeth bothered him. He was slightly built with a sharply hooked nose and large pierced ears. We might guess that he was a bit vain, since even as a very old man, his hair was dyed a stunning shade of red. Until the very end, Ramesses II remained Ramesses the Great, active, assertive, and an enormous presence in the life of his nation. But even for a living God, the end in this world does finally come. In 1213 BC, Ramses II at last died, around the age of 90. Considering life expectancy in Egypt was just a little over 30, the gods may have been revealing to mortals the great nature of their king. He was succeeded by his 13th son, Menepta, who ruled for another nine years before he too died. But of the many other sons of Ramses, we know of the tombs of just two. All the rest have vanished. They are the lost princes of Egypt. The long reign of Ramesses II at last came to an end in 1212 BC. 
It was surely a time of great sadness in Egypt. Few of Ramesses' subjects would have known any other king. For 40 days, priests performed the exacting ritual of mummification on Ramses' body. The stomach, intestines, liver and lungs were placed in special containers called canopic jars. The body was dried with a special salt, then adorned with jeweled amulets and wrapped in linen strips. At last, the mummy was placed in an elaborate coffin and began the journey to the Valley of the Kings in southern Egypt. We're standing in the tomb of Ramesses II. This magnificent chamber has only recently been excavated and has never been filmed before. This is the largest single room in the Valley of the Kings. The pharaoh's mummified body would have been carried into this chamber and lowered into a huge sarcophagus placed here. His internal organs in their canopic jars would be put into an alabaster chest here and lowered into this shaft. Above it was a beautiful gilded wooden shrine. The priests, having completed their last rituals, would have swept away the dust of their footprints as they backed out of the tomb, leaving the great pharaoh alone here for eternity in this beautiful space deep within the mountain. The world has seen the beautiful treasures that were discovered in the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun, who died over a hundred years before Ramesses. If this was the treasure that was buried with Tut, a minor king with little impact on Egyptian history, we can begin to imagine the magnificent objects and adornment which must have filled the tomb of Ramesses the Great. But Ramesses was not lucky in his choice of final resting place. Within 150 years, tomb robbers had found their way in and carried off what must have been a treasure beyond our dreams from this, the tomb of the pharaoh of the pharaohs. All we have left are a few precious fragments recently discovered by the French Egyptologist Christian Leblanc. In the tomb of Ramses II, a number of objects which belonged to the funeral decoration were found, notably vestiges of the canopic jars in which the viscera of the king had been placed. We also found vestiges of the funeral bed. At the front end were two leopard heads like these, which still show very beautiful traces of color, which look like gold. And this absolutely exceptional piece, a statuette of Ramses as a rather young man, it was placed near the king's mummy in a tomb which must have been absolutely sumptuous, one of the most beautiful royal tombs. Robbers had invaded tombs since the earliest days of royal burials. Usually working in gangs, they sometimes bribed guards. More often, they simply broke into the tombs after political unrest or threats to national security distracted the attention of those charged with their protection. Other than these few artifacts, Ramesses' great burial treasure had vanished. But by some miracle, Ramesses' mummy was undisturbed. The priests, who saw pharaonic mummies as gods, took drastic action to protect Ramesses' remains from desecration. Along with the corpse of his father, Seti, and many other kings, Ramesses' mummy was secretly moved to an ancient, long-ignored tomb less than a mile from the Valley of the Kings. Here, the body of one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs was left unceremoniously stacked with other royal mummies. His secret resting place was so near, yet so far, from the place which had been so lavishly crafted to hold his corpse. His own great tomb now sat abandoned and unprotected. The final indignity was that in the centuries after the pharaoh's mummy was carried out of here, 
the rare desert thunderstorms came in and filled this tomb with water. The magnificent paintings and carvings which once covered every surface here were devastated. Plaster fell from walls, rock carvings collapsed, and flood debris steadily filled this tomb from floor right up to the ceiling. Those who discovered this place could barely find enough space to enter it. Finally, over 3,000 years after they were hidden, the mummies in the secret cache were recovered in 1881 by German museum curator Emil Bruch. The whereabouts of Ramesses' remains were no longer a secret. But nothing was found in the hidden cache of mummies or in Ramesses' own tomb to shed light on the mystery of the great king's missing sons. How could these princes, whose existence had been so thoroughly documented, vanish from history? It would take over 100 years to find an answer. That answer suggests that Ramses' sons may have been within walking distance of their father's tomb all along. Coming out of Ramses' tomb into the Valley of the Kings, you can see that he had company. There are 61 other tombs here. Just a short walk up there is the legendary tomb of Tutankhamun. Seti I, Ramses' father, is buried there. Menepta, his son, just around the corner. But where are the tombs of the many other sons of Ramses? Well, just 30 yards away over there is tomb Kings Valley number five. And KV5 may well hold the answer to that question. In 1825, the Egyptologist James Burton entered the tomb he pronounced it unimportant. Later, this whole area was buried under tons of rubble. Tourist buses passed within feet. In 1987, American Egyptologist Kent Weeks uncovered this entrance to the tomb. When at last he entered, he made what many call the most important discovery in Egypt since Tutankhamun. For the first time in over 3,000 years, the world edged closer to at last solving the great mystery of Ramesses' lost sons. For 450 years, Egypt's pharaohs were buried in a desolate desert canyon as a safeguard against tomb robbers. It has come to be known as the Valley of the Kings. Here, 62 tombs were dug from the limestone. These subterranean palaces were embellished with sumptuously beautiful carvings and paintings. But by the third century BC, the Valley of the Kings lay silent and forgotten. In the early 18th century, an English clergyman named Richard Pocock visited the valley and drew its first map. Other European Egyptologists followed, but their mapping of the tombs remained imprecise and inaccurately plotted. In the 1970s, Dr. Kent Weeks, a leading American Egyptologist from Washington State, decided to begin the first mapping of the Valley of the Kings using survey techniques which relied on extremely accurate measurements. It would take over a decade of hard work just to accumulate all of the data. But sadly, by the late 1980s, there was little money left to print up the detailed map Weeks wanted. So he decided to use the knowledge he'd accumulated and tackle another ambitious task. So I thought we would, what we would do is to take the little money that we had at that point and do something that I had considered doing a few years earlier. And that was to go back into the historical records, try to identify tombs that had been seen in the 19th century, but for one reason or another had gone missing, and try to relocate those tombs and put them on the map of the Valley of the Kings as well. After an extensive search of historical records, one tomb stood out. It had been seen during the 19th century and given the designation KV-5, standing for King's Valley Number no. 5. In 1825, the Englishman James Burton cut a 25-metre crawl space into KV-5. He drew a sketch plan which revealed the presence of 11 chambers. But
but his notes did not inspire enthusiasm or excitement from his peers. Even Howard Carter, the discoverer of Tutankhamun's tomb, used the KV-5 hillside only as a dumping ground for debris from his excavations. They buried the tomb under three meters of fill. As if that weren't enough, another series of flash floods from torrential rains that hit the Valley of the Kings occasionally dumped more debris over the tomb entrance and hid it. By 1920, possibly even earlier than that, KV-5 was a dim and distant memory. There was nothing to be seen. But Kent Weeks was intrigued by the drawings of the tomb that Burton had made. In his plan, it looked like no other tomb that I had ever seen before. Most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings are long corridors cut deeply into the bedrock. This tomb, on the other hand, had, in Burton's drawing, about six chambers that went off in all directions from the entrance like tentacles of an octopus. And I thought, gosh, what a strange looking tomb. Why don't we see if we can't locate this? Something else grabbed Weeks' interest. By 1989, some researchers were suggesting that the lost KV-5 might also be the missing tomb of Ramesses' children. From Burton's notes, Kent Weeks had an idea of where in the valley to begin looking. He made a decision. He would try and find what had been lost for so long. We dug basically a narrow trench about three feet, a meter wide. The first thing we encountered was a cut in the bedrock that very clearly delimited a man-made, not a natural, pit or depression in the hillside. And then we began finding traces of staircases. After months of hard work, Kent Wheat's staff had cleared the entrance pit to KV-5. Now at last, the moment had arrived to look inside. Well, in the summer of 1989, we had cleared the stairway, come down to this doorway leading into the first chamber. Now, it didn't look like this. It was completely filled, floor to ceiling, with flood debris that had washed in. What sort of level? Right to here, R right, right to here. To and it was only because of a small little channel that had been dug by James Burton in 1825 that we could see anything at all inside. Here are traces of Burton's lamp black on the ceilings where he was peering through. So you just crawled through Burton's original tiny hole? That's right. Get... That was the only access into the tomb. And even at that point, we could not see any of the side walls. Are we talking about inches here? Or what sort of size was this? Well, it was a tight fit for me. Let's put it that way, <laughs> a very tight fit. So you managed to crawl in, probably a little guessing that you were going to be working just in this room for how long? What you say? It took us five years to clean this chamber out. But even by the second year, we knew that we were onto something in KV-5. Because at the top of the wall, we found a series of hieroglyphs that indicated that this tomb was the burial place of one of the sons of Ramses II, whose cartouche is here. And we have his name, Amenher Chepeshev. Now, that young man was the firstborn son of Ramses II. So this was the first confirmation you had that one of Ramses' sons might be buried here? Yes, exactly. And the firstborn son at that. But shortly thereafter, it got even better. Because on this wall, when we exposed the text at the top, we found another scene with Ramses, a god, and a son who here is not Amenher Chepeshev, but a son whom we call Ramses Jr. to avoid confusion with his father. Suddenly, we knew that we had a tomb with multiple burials. There were, at this point, at least two royal sons buried in this tomb. That was something that had never been seen before. Kent Weeks was now certain that KV-5 promised to be much more than just a minor tomb, even though he still didn't know if it was bigger than the 11 chambers detailed in Burton's original sketch. But making progress in unlocking kv 5 secrets was agonizingly slow. The Valley of the Kings may get, on average, uh, one or two millimeters of rain a year, if that. But every once in a while, perhaps once every 50, 60, 70 years, a rainstorm hits this area and it causes disaster. By the time those waters, those floodwaters and their debris reach KV-5, the entrance to the valley, they can be traveling at 30, 40 miles an hour, carrying boulders the size of stoves or refrigerators. The 11 floods that hit KV-5 filled it chock-a-block full with debris, sand, silt, limestone chips, 
that over the centuries dried to an almost cement-like consistency. Clearing away tons of flood debris which filled the tomb proved to be enormously time-consuming. The techniques of moving dirt out of a tomb or any archaeological site in Egypt haven't changed much in the last 100 years. We still take baskets. These are made of old tires. Fill them up using trowels or shovels or picks, whatever, and carry them by hand in a bucket brigade out the door of the tomb. It had taken five years just to empty two small rooms. Although Kent Weeks had uncovered the names of two of Ramesses' sons, he'd found little else. Now the much larger Chamber 3 waited to be cleared. What Weeks would discover in this part of the tomb would justify all the years of patience and hard work. Kent Weeks crawled into the third chamber into this tiny gap. He hoped to find something underneath this huge pile of debris. But he couldn't get to it. He realized that the weakness of these pillars and the ominous cracks in the limestone ceiling above my head meant that this whole area would have to be stabilized, work that's only just been completed. Now, Burton's map shows a mysterious door against the back wall. And Kent Weeks gradually dug his way towards it until by 1995, he managed to find just enough space to crawl through that doorway. What happened next is one of the great moments of modern archaeology. Kent Weeks at last prepared to look beyond Chamber 3. He would be heading into space no one had entered since the pharaohs. We thought what we would find is another small chamber, like that in the front, chamber one, chamber two. Instead, we shone our flashlight down, and we saw nothing, nothing. blackness. <laughs> it meant that the chamber went on and on and on. We could not see an end wall. Later on, when we put electricity in the tomb, it turned into the most incredible sight I'd ever seen in my life. A 100 feet down the corridor, lined on either side with doorways, we find a statue of the god Osiris. So you came along here, and you must already have known that this was the most incredible find. I kept saying to myself, my God, I can't believe it. There's nothing like this anywhere in the Valley of the Kings. There are chambers here on every side. I mean, Every 10 feet or so, we find a doorway, some leading into small chambers, others leading into suites of rooms. Most of them are blocked up, but you can see them quite clearly where they are. Yeah, we haven't dug these yet. It's <clears> incredible. <throat> you must have known at this moment that what you were finding here was probably one of the most important archaeological discoveries of the century. Nothing like this has ever been found before. So you got to this point here and you saw this amazing sight. A life-size statue of what at first we thought was the god Osiris, but what we now think is a representation of King Ramses as Osiris, the deified king welcoming his sons down this corridor and into the next life. The beautiful statue of Ramses offered further proof that this was almost certainly a tomb for his royal sons. And with the amazing discovery of Corridor 7 and its complex of rooms, the significance of what Kent Weeks had revealed began to dawn on the world. Most of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings contain no more than eight rooms. Ramses I, Ramses the Great's grandfather, had just four, as did the legendary Tutankhamun. Weeks had already discovered at least 65 rooms, and more soon appeared. Nothing like it had ever been found. KV-5 seemed to move off in all directions at once. This corridor is very perplexing. It drops more steeply than any other corridor in the tomb. In fact, some of the side chambers that are cut here actually lie beneath the floor of chambers on an upper level. Now, at the bottom of this steeply sloping corridor, suddenly we descend four steps, and we find ourselves in another large pillared hall. In this case, one with three pillars down the center of the rectangular room. This is a good example, by the way, of the stratigraphy that we're confronted with in KV-5. Filling this chamber, like the others, chock-a-block full of flood debris, you can see the different layers. Deep inside the tomb, hundreds of feet from the entrance, flood debris continued to be a problem. <laughs> uh, 
This is one of the many unexcavated corridors in KV-5. This one heads south, directly towards Tutankhamun's tomb. Nobody's quite sure why. There's a blank wall at the end there. Maybe another doorway. The problem is getting to it. With all its chambers and corridors, this tomb is nearly half the size of a football field. And all of it is packed with this debris. Behind it, they may find more pottery remains, canopic jars, maybe even mummified remains. Some of this stuff is as hard as concrete. Mechanical excavation is out of the question. All of it, tons and tons of it, has to be removed by hand. But the flood debris was only one of the obstacles which still hid the secrets of KV-5. I think this is one of the most potentially interesting parts of KV-5, but unfortunately it's also the most dangerous. Because it lay under the roadway, which for the last 40 years has had tour buses rolling over it, the entire ceiling has collapsed. It would be a very expensive undertaking, but I'd be willing to bet you that if we were able to do this, we will find evidence here, maybe a sarcophagus, maybe other funerary equipment, that clearly proves that this Chamber 5 was the place where one of the sons of the king was buried. Because of the flooding, carvings and paintings on the walls of KV-5 had been badly damaged. But as the chambers began to be emptied, remnants of carving made it clear that KV-5 had once been magnificently decorated. Now the carving on this north wall here in Corridor 7 is absolutely spectacular. It's one of the best examples we have of relief carving in the tomb. Originally, of course, it was painted and all we have now are the outlines. But even so, you can see the elegant workmanship in this figure of a son. Unfortunately, his name is missing. Again being presented by his father, Ramses II, across a pile of offerings to the gods, in this case, Knum and the goddess Hathor, elegantly carved in a beautiful face. But a strange thing happens in this corridor right at this point. Up to now, we've had beautiful relief carving. That stops, and instead, from here onward, the walls are roughened. It's called keying for plaster. I have no idea what the reason for this is, except one possibility. Perhaps this corridor originally stopped at this point, went no further, and then the corridor was lengthened, the tomb was enlarged, in order to provide additional burial space for additional sons of Ramses II who had predeceased him. As more and more damaged carvings have been revealed in the tomb, the job of reconstructing their original form has been handled by Kent's wife, Susan. She painstakingly makes detailed tracings which are studied to recreate the missing carvings and the paint which covered them. Once the missing lines are redrawn, Susan replicates the original colors based on tiny fragments of paint found on the tomb's walls. This is the son of Ramses. He's wearing a very bright blue collar, and he's wearing a rather elaborate priestly sacred garment, which is yellow with red um, stripes. Every day is exciting. You never know what you might see. Every time we look at the walls, even though I may have drawn the wall and stared at it for 10 days, every once in a while the light changes, there's something different I see for the first time. Finally, after 3,500 years, we can again look upon the glorious paintings which once enhanced this tomb. But in KV-5, success is often matched by frustration. Again and again, the tomb seemed to taunt the weeks, as if the great Ramesses himself were withholding the answer to the mystery of his missing sons. We know that originally this tomb was magnificently decorated with brilliantly colored painted relief, but because of the flooding, a lot of that paint and plaster has washed off. And nowhere is that more frustrating than in this scene in the second chamber. We have Ramses II, a figure of his son, and directly above the son, we can just make out the hieroglyphs, king's son of his body, and the name is missing. We have no idea who it, who it might be. Given the title, given a figure of the son, we were very excited about this. It could be maybe son number six, number seven, number eight in our list of people buried in this tomb. We were so close, but we just didn't get the cigar. 
After 10 years of excavation, KV-5, with more than 100 chambers, had already proven to be the largest and most uniquely designed tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and probably in all of Egypt. It had clearly been built by Ramesses II, and little by little, evidence had begun to accumulate that indeed, he had created this tomb for his many sons. We have the names of several sons written on the walls of KV-5. We have more than two dozen representations of the king presenting various of his sons in the afterlife to the gods. We have objects, grave goods, canopic jars, found in the several chambers in KV-5, and on those we have the names and titles of five different sons of Ramses II. Kent Weeks would soon find evidence of a much more personal nature. In 1998, KV-5 at last began to give up some of the bodies that had rested in this special tomb for so very long. Like any good mystery, what was needed to solve KV-5 was a body. After nine years of searching, Kent Weeks finally found one. We had so many irons in the fire during the early years of work in KV-5 that it wasn't until just a couple of seasons ago that we cleared the northern half of this room, Chamber 2. And much to our surprise, when we got down to floor level, we found two parallel, very nice, regular cuts that defined what obviously was a pit. Now, I think originally this may have been the burial place of whoever was buried in this tomb when it was only a two-chambered tomb in the 18th dynasty. What we found when we got to the bottom of the pit was a series of layers of bones. And beneath that, three adult male human skulls with the neck vertebra still attached and traces of mummified tissue and wrappings over their body. Beneath that, we found a fully articulated adult male body, a mummy, about 50 years old, lying in a position like this directly on the ground. And I think, probably, Given the position of the arms and the position of the body, it may well be that that, and maybe the other three skulls too, are in fact sons of Ramses II. Why would so important a mummy be left in such a crude and unadorned pit? Kent Weeks believes the answer is very simple. When tomb robbers entered KV-5, they went down deep into the tomb, into the burial chambers of his sons, grabbed the mummies and brought them up here near the front door where the light was good and they could see what they were doing. They ripped the bodies apart in their search for gold jewelry and pectoral necklaces and so forth, and then simply dumped the body parts on the ground. Some of them washed into this pit. This is one of the three skulls that came from the pit in chamber two. And what we're doing now is cleaning this, getting it ready to study, not by us, but by anatomists and geneticists. All of the teeth are rather heavily worn, including the, uh, the front, the incisors, the canines. And all of these features, together with the sutures, the joins between the bones and the skull, suggest that this is probably uh, an adult male. The next thing, of course, we'll want to do is to see, try to determine, if we can, whether this is the skull of an individual who is related to the other bodies in the tomb. We would love to relate them to Ramses. Anybody who's seen a photograph of the mummy of Ramses, or even, in fact, a representation of him in Egyptian art, recognized the fact that he was shown with a very prominent nose. And that might be one of the, the anatomical features that we could look for in trying to determine relationships. Scientific analysis of skulls is only one of the many tasks that can't be done in the heat and dust of the Valley of the Kings. Some of the most demanding work in unlocking the secrets of KV-5 doesn't happen here in the tomb at all, but rather in an office back in Cairo. When we started work on the Theban mapping project back in 1979, we were operating on a real shoestring. Today, we have a full-time staff on the project of eight people down, and a part-time staff of volunteers and part-time employees who were scattered all over the world. It's a very diverse project, and one of the fun things about being an archaeologist these days is, in fact, trying to pull all of these disparate specialties together. Can you pull that up in section? 
what I'd like to do, Summer, is take a look at this detail in here. The, the work our graphic designers and architects are doing is extremely useful. It gives you a new means of looking at the material and of doing comparative studies of that material. We want to prepare a CD-ROM of the Theban necropolis, taking advantage of the photographs that our staff have been collecting, the architectural drawings that we have been preparing, and of course, historical materials as well. We'll be able, for example, to stop at a site like Luxor Temple on the East Bank, and we'll be able to generate a series of three-dimensional drawings that show the various stages in the construction of this temple. This, of course, is KV-5. We thought we could produce something that would not only be useful to scholars, but that could be fun and exciting for grade school kids, for example, eight, nine-year-olds who are doing Egyptology in school for the first time. In spite of all his efforts, Kent Weeks is the first to admit that there is much yet to be done in KV-5. The work is exacting and slow, and the task has continued to grow. So far, 150 rooms have been found, and only 7% of those have been cleared. But one thing has already been established. In 3,000 years of tomb construction in ancient Egypt, there is nothing that remotely resembles KV-5 in its incredible size or design. Why did Ramesses II apparently create so unusual a mausoleum for his many sons? Kent Weeks thinks he has one answer. We know that during his reign, he had himself declared to be divine. He had to assign to his children, to at least the heir apparent, many of the secular duties that he would ordinarily have performed. Now, once one of his sons, the heir apparent, was made a secular pharaoh, he was no longer simply a son who might one day inherit the throne. He was a junior king, and you have to bury a junior king in a rather more elaborate way. Numerous other of his sons, each of whom in turn had moved into this strange junior king position, died before him, and they too came to be interred in this very strange tomb. There are still more questions than answers to be found in KV-5, but the tomb has proven that our knowledge of ancient Egypt is far from complete. For Kent Weeks, the search, as always, will go on. He has wanted to be an Egyptologist since he was a boy in Washington State. Now he hopes to give something back to the work he so loves. In addition to our work in KV-5 over the next several years, one of the things I most want to do is help develop a master plan for the protection of the Valley of the Kings, and indeed for all of Thebes. Rising groundwater, pollution, increasing population in the adjacent villages, increasing tourism are taking their toll on all of the sites here, tombs and temples both. I can't think of anything that would make me sadder than to realize that future generations would be denied the opportunity to visit something as magical as the Valley of the Kings. It would be a real shame if little eight-year-old kids in Everett, Washington, a hundred years from now, couldn't dream of this place like I did. Ken Weeks has been working on KV-5 for over 10 years. Sometimes there was no assurance that his work would reveal any more than a few empty rooms, and always the distraction of having to find funds to support all of this. But his patience and hard work have yielded what is becoming one of the most exciting finds in Egyptology. Over the next few years, KV-5 will reveal more of its secrets. Why was such an immense tomb built? What's become of its contents? And maybe, just maybe, Kent Weeks will discover if other sons of the great Ramses still rest somewhere within these walls. Yeah.